Welcome to the Seekers Forum guest interview series. Today, Mark speaks with Thomas Moore, author of the best-selling classic, Care of the Soul, and 15 other books on deepening spirituality and cultivating soul in every aspect of life. Moore has been a monk, a musician, a university professor, and a psychotherapist, and today he lectures widely on holistic medicine, spirituality, psychotherapy, and the arts. Mark talked to him about this month's Seekers Forum topic, What the Shadow Knows, Discovering Our Secret Knowledge. Now, here's Mark. Hello, Thomas. It's good to talk to you again, and, and I want to welcome you to, to the Seekers Forum. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks. You know, even before Care of the Soul, I came to your work through Dark Eros, which is a book that, that really changed the way I looked at not only the nature of desire, but also the whole idea that one was supposed to be better than one is, sort of to aspire to transcend, you know, the muck and, 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 and the shadow and the darkness. It was such a liberation for me. And when I read that book, there are a handful of lines that I underlined that have actually become a part of, uh, of my practice and, and things that I return to over and over. So I'd like to just touch on those today uh, and let those be the, the, the outline of what we talk about. The first quote is, that the only morality adequate to the complexities of life is one that has been sculpted in the presence of the shadow. What do you mean by saying that, that for a morality to be adequate to the complexities of life, it needs to be, it needs to be sculpted in the presence of, of the parts of ourselves that we may disown? I think there's a tendency among even very intelligent people, intelligent in various areas, maybe not in this one, to think too plainly, simplistically about uh, being a moral person and what being good or bad and what's good and what's bad. Uh, I think that each person, as far as I can tell, especially rooted in my experience as a therapist over many years, very good people struggle sometimes and do things that other people would consider immoral and maybe they do themselves feel are not right uh, and yet they just feel the, such a strong pull and or maybe they just did something out of ignorance or accidentally or under pressure or emotional pressure life is extremely complicated nobody is simple boy if that's not something I have learned then I've got nothing from all those years everyone is complicated that's a good thing. I think it's a very good thing. Complicated in the sense that there's a lot going on in us. And I think that if we're going to have a morality, a real morality, that is not just an escape into some kind of uh, some simplistic idea of what's right or wrong, then we have to recognize that, that all of us are, are drawn into behavior or thoughts or uh, saying things that uh, are just not good, not right, that hurt people, that are dangerous to the world around us, and so on. And if we can acknowledge that shadow, and I call it that, then we, we have a chance of de developing a morality that will really count, I think, that we can base our lives on. And if we discount the shadow, what kind of morality do we create for ourselves? We create this, this attitude that I know what's right or wrong, and I'm a good person mm. because I do what's right. You know, show me one person who's always done what's right. There is no such thing. So what do you do with that? Do you just say, well, I've sinned, I've made a mistake, or I, what? Um, and then you keep going and you don't count it? I think what you have to do is recognize that all of us are capable of, of all kinds of terrible things. We don't do them. We can become moral persons and ethical people, but only if we acknowledge the shadow in ourselves and in other people and are slow to judge and understand the subtleties of behavior that, you know, you look at someone, like let's say you look at a politician who's caught in some sexual misconduct, which is a common occurrence. It's so easy to moralize. I think when people moralize and judge a person like that very easily, what they're doing is really protecting and defending themselves, and they don't have to face their own complexity then, and maybe their own uh, hidden desire. But it's easy then to place that morality on someone else. Whereas someone who's in public life may have, you know, they've given themselves to this life. When, when you enter the public public life, you, I think you have greater challenges and your sexuality especially gets 
turned up a notch or two because that's part of being in that extremely demanding and creative life. I give a lot of leeway to people who who have given themselves to, you know, sacrificing themselves in a way to the public. I think we have to acknowledge that they, they that they have to be understood that they've done something special. We have to give them some breaks. Mm. That's exactly the opposite of how most of people in the public think of it. They think of it because they've taken on that role, they should be held, held to higher standards. Yeah, I know. I know. I, everything I say is just the opposite. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's true. It's just the way it goes. <laughs> right. Now, even beyond the parts of the so-called shadow that are destructive and, and to be resisted, isn't it true also that we, we get a measure of our richness and our individuality and, and our character from the so-called shadow? Well, of course, yes. If we, if, imagine somebody who, who doesn't um, acknowledge any shadow in their life, that they are just full of virtue and wonderful and everything they do is great. What an uninteresting person. I wouldn't want to have dinner with that person. You know, it's like that, there's no complexity there. There's no, there's no life. There's no saying yes to life. There's no facing the challenges that most of us have to face, these, these moral dilemmas that are not easy. Uh, and we have to make choices that other people may judge us for, but we do them anyway. I'll tell you when I when I uh, do my uh, doing therapy, I, what I notice is that that there are people who, let's say, people in marriages. I see this very often. People in marriages that are just really terrible for them. The marriage has been a really a terrible experience, but their family thinks that divorce is is evil or wrong or immoral, so they won't get divorced. They uh, they, they, they don't necessarily agree with that, but they feel so much pressure from their family. Those family members are just, what are they doing? They're, they're demanding some kind of simplistic morality for uh, somebody else. And uh, I think that's, that's pretty despicable, really, because we have to be able to support each other and, and help each other get through these moral dilemmas and deal with our shadow side. But like you said, unless we are welcome the shadow in ourselves, uh, we can't open to the full sort of through the full 360 of another person. It's just too threatening. It it works. It works both ways. At the same time, you have to be able to allow it in others and in yourself. If you leave out either one, then it doesn't work at all. You quote James Hillman in the book when he said that our own pathologies are what make us individuals. That sounds so counterintuitive. You know, we're taught to resist pathology. What do you think he meant by pathology in that context? What he meant by pathology primarily was the the impact of passion on the soul, because the word pathos means to be affected, to be have an impact on you, something to hit you. So something hits you, and uh, let's say some desire, some longing, some fear, or some memory from childhood, some trauma, something like that, and it has an impact on you, and you have this pathology. An example would be someone who has had abuse, physical or sexual abuse, as a child. That is a that's a pathology that has really struck them. And when I work with someone in that situation, what I what I try to keep in mind is that we don't want to get in a place where we wish away this experience because that's crazy. It it happened, and there's nothing else we can do. But there is a way we can look at this experience and find that that the pain and the the impact of the effect it's had on a person can actually be be worked at can be reflected upon and reimagined and reimagined to the point that that becomes a strength that can become a moral strength for a person so i think that's what hillman meant as you work through all these things it's working through your pathology that you you're working i mean you're doing something with yourself with your life what's given to you and in that process, you become an individual instead of just unconsciously joining the crowd. Mm-hmm. And that's different than being, uh, you know, quote unquote, glad that it happened or, or grateful that it oh, happened. Oh no, no, no! You never want those things to happen. There, it's a terrible thing to have to, to go through. And some people who have severe, severe abuse never ever get out of it. I mean, it's it's just so so destructive. No, I don't mean that at all. I'm just saying that it is. That that's an extreme example, but just think for for anybody who has had experiences that have been difficult 
and most of us have had them on one kind or another, some kind of pathology, some difficulty, some fear, you know, jealousy or anxiety, uh, fear of heights even, uh, phobias that we have, uh, not liking to be in crowds, not liking to speak in public. These kinds of things are all pathologies. And instead of trying to get rid of them, I mean, this was Hillman's work, his whole lifelong work, was saying instead of getting rid of these things, let's, let's acknowledge them, own them, and let them do their work on us. And they then help us become an individual. Because here, it's very hard to say this, instead of remaining automatic in life and unconscious, you've got to work at that. You have to talk about it. You have to try to do something with it. You give it attention throughout your life. That makes you into a real person. And when you say that, that not admitting to the negative side of desire, we're surprised when it appears and assume it to be the eruption of something completely evil or alien. You're really saying the same thing, aren't you? It, it's opening to, to the full 360 so that we don't have to dissociate from parts of ourselves when, when they show up. I think that's right. The other thing I had in mind there was that uh, we can cultivate an appreciation for a shadow all the time. There may be a moment when you'd notice, any of us might notice that we're defending ourselves so that we remain innocent, that nobody can see our shadow. We do that all the time. I think almost all of us do that. Well, you can cultivate the shadow by just letting, letting that be. If someone, if someone recognizes that you, there's something not quite perfect about you, you just let it be. You don't have to defend it or explain it away. There's a temptation to speak in a way that you will come out smelling better, you know, that you won't be seen as being dark in any way. Well, if you can cultivate that, allow that shadow, then when you are having to face some eruption that is very dark in you, then you are acquainted with it, you're used to it, you're that far ahead when you have to deal with something that's much bigger. Makes so much sense. What do you mean when you say that marriages may be made in heaven, but they are hatched in hell? It's such a great line. Well, I just mean to say that we tend to glorify marriage, especially at the beginning, and we would go to weddings and talk about marriage. Very often we glorify it. I know that, I guess, that there are people who, who have these wonderful marriages where they seem to be happy all the time. I don't know. I haven't had that experience. I don't. I don't know anyone personally who's really been able to do that. Most marriages are are uh, like a cauldron where you have to face so much because your partner gets to know you quite well and knows you, knows your weaknesses, and all your subtle ways of manipulating life, and all those things that normally would be private. Your partner knows those things and doesn't let you get away with them. And there's a lot of unconsciousness that comes out. A lot of these complexes come forward in marriages. Um, like the very simple, obvious one in the more Freudian way would be that the parent uh, figures, uh, your experience in family comes through in marriage. And then you work those things through in your marriage. Well, all of that is is very difficult stuff, and people get very frustrated. And And for a lot of people, marriage is a torture, even at the same time, it's, it's a delight. It's wonderful. It can be a mixture of both of those things. And I think very often in marriages, you'll see that there's a, a predominance of one or the other, so that some marriages are generally pretty happy, but there are those times that are really unbearable. And there are other marriages that are basically unbearable. Every once in a while, there's something good that happens. Right. But the use of the word hatched implies that it's going through the hell that gives, gives new life. And that brings sort of new life to the individual and the marriage. Is that, is that well, part of what you're saying? That's the same as what we were just talking about. That, that yes, it's uh, that if you can face those those pathologies, those difficult moments, those things that are that are most difficult, challenging. If you can deal with those, then your marriage is you 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 understand maybe better what marriage is. That you're not always looking for everything to be rosy. What you're looking for is something that's real where you have a real relationship with someone and the intimacy seems so strong and deep-rooted rather than superficial. I think over time your very idea of what it means to be married can change. And that's what I mean by being hatched, that it's 
it's hatched, it becomes something real, but only have, after you go through all these different initiations. Beautiful. Later in the book, you, you talk about the, the conflict or the tension between soul and spirit, which is a major, such a big theme in all of your work, and that the soul may be battered by the spirit's demands. What did you mean by that? That resonated in me so deeply because I see a lot of seekers you know, struggling to transcend, transcend their, their imperfections and feeling like losers and failures all the time. Is that what you mean by the soul being battered by the spirit's demands? Yes, I think that's part of it. There's so many different ways of looking at it. Yes, people with all the greatest intentions, our seekers are looking. They want a meaningful life. They want to be good people. They want to be the best they can. And uh, they often find uh, communities or leaders or books or systems that are just not worth their attention. There's a lot of junk out there. You know, there's a lot of a lot of appealing things that really are not not as good as they appear to be. And so mm-hmm. people will get wrapped up in things where they feel they should be. Oh, I don't know, they should be in meditation hours and hours, or they should be praying, or they should be uh, uh, giving up the, the various things in their life, or maybe money, or they should uh, give up sex, or I don't know. There's so many things that people go through there's an awful lot of I, I can't keep coming back to the sexual I guess because it's so important in these matters I've worked with so many people who's who have had a spiritual background maybe through traditional religion or maybe not where they have been taught essentially that their sexuality is to be very suspect that they should try to control it as much as they can or maybe even just get rid of it you know ignore it if possible I've worked with people like that who spent years I mean decades with those thoughts and they have suffered so much and their marriages have suffered as a result there's just been so much uh, unhappiness so that's a way in which the soul which just wants love and just wants some pleasure you know just some pleasure in life and and some some little satisfaction about life and loving life the spirit is there saying you need to do more you should be better you should reach higher and it's never enough, and the demands are very strong, and they're presented in ways that are so noble and so uh, so big that the person feels bad if they don't follow them. And we have to be very careful with spirit. That's why I'm always suggesting in my work that we bring soul and spirit together, that the ordinary pleasures and desires in life are as important as those high, noble, sublime expectations of the spirit. And it really does make the whole idea of self-improvement kind of suspect. Very suspect. So yeah. suspect, I would say, let's just drop that one. You know, Forget about it. Okay, that will probably appeal to a lot of people listening to this talk. Now, Thomas, when you say that when someone is suffering, there's someone turning the screws, you know, someone whose job it is to tend the, the chamber of horrors, what do you mean that, that it's a separate part of ourselves that's holding us so that's turning the screws and keeping our feet in the fire. I was interested in the way you, you know, sort of created two characters there. Well, you know, this, this book you, that you were mentioning at the beginning, Dark Eros, is based on the work of the Marquis de Sade. So it's about sadomasochism, essentially. And uh, I, I mean it in just everyday terms, that uh, in our ordinary interactions with people, let's say you bump into a policeman or you go, you go to the doctor or the dentist, a dentist is a good example. You go to a dentist and you're going to the dentist to be helped, but that dentist is going to stick this thing in your mouth that's going to hurt like crazy. You know, there's a sadism there. It's useful, but it's the, the, the dentist has to be willing to inflict that pain in order to give, you know, protect your health. So that you can see how a doctor or even a policeman might be in the same position. So uh, there's sadomasochism in our life all over the place, and it's fine because we... We can submit willingly to it, and that's that's okay. And we can figure out how much pain we can take and what it's worth, and, and then and then make the agreement with whoever it is. Well, I think we have an internal situation like that as well. That uh, there may be an element in us where we 
are willing to be vulnerable in life. We're willing to have experiences that are not the easiest to go through. I think going to school, going to college is an example of that. At least in my experience, going to college and sitting for exams and spending all that time studying, none of that is very pleasant. Much of it involves a lot of pain. But we do it because we have a goal in mind and we allow these teachers to to inflict these various uh, tortures on us. That's okay, but it's still a sadomasic situation. Now, what I say in this book is that that's a very fine balance, and it can easily get out of hand. You can have teachers who have become real sadists. I've had that experience. My daughter had a teacher once who was a real sadist, a terrible, terrible sadist. There's a, there's a tendency within certain professions in that direction because that's just the nature of the thing. And there's a long, long tradition about education being a sadomasochistic enterprise. So we have to be very careful in our day-to-day lives. We submit to people, and we also submit to internal feelings and thoughts that we have. And we may have like a superego voice in us that says, now, don't eat too much. You know, don't eat those things you like. Well, if you listen to that voice constantly and just do what it says, you're not going to have much joy in life. You will be a masochist. You will have you will submit to that voice that's very strong in you that's always saying, don't do this and don't do that. You can track that voice maybe to actual people who have said that to you in the past, like your parents or teachers. But the fact is it's been internalized and there it is. So that you might identify more often with the sadist. Other people will be just the opposite. They tend to enjoy being the sadist. So it's a complicated business, but that's what I was talking about. So this really, just the same way with self-improvement, this changes the way we think about discipline, you know, that, that there's a, a certain amount of torture that's permissible, that if it helps us, you know, helps us grow if we feel like we're expanding. And, but it, when, when, when it goes too far, then we become masochistic to the point of our own, our, our own detriment. Is that, is that, am I getting that right? Absolutely. And then what happens is that gets acted out with people so that you might meet somebody and you have a a sadomasochistic relationship because you will identify, you will embody the masochist and allow the other person to be the sadist. That's what I'm saying. You might do that with a dentist, but that's for your mutual good and it's okay. But if you do it with a, a person, an ordinary person, let them have control over you, too much control over you, This happens in spiritual communities a lot. You surrender a lot of control to somebody in authority. And when you do that, then you begin to lose your own power. Gradually, you lose it and lose it and lose it. And then you become a real masochist and suffer a great deal. That happens so much. It does. My favorite passage in the book is this one. When the heart is freed from its benevolent captivity in ordinary morality, then what does it want? Where does its freedom take it? That is such a beautiful question. Can we talk first about what you mean by its benevolent captivity in ordinary morality? Yes. What I mean is that uh, maybe I'm speaking a lot for myself there because... Oh, good. Be personal. That's that's good. <laughs> well, I grew up in a Catholic family, and uh, there's a lot of sadomasochism there. A lot of morality, a lot of uh, interest in what's right and what's wrong, and trying to be good. And uh, that's all I heard, I think, as a child, to be good, and all the things I had to do to be good. And I couldn't be bad. You know, there just wasn't an option. And what was bad was just having life and being alive, being really full of vitality and individuality that was considered, though, not not appropriate. So I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of that conventional benevolent morality. These people were very kind and just saying, oh, you've got to be a good kid. And when you grow up, then, you know, you'll be a good person and you'll be happy and you'll die and go to heaven. You know, it's a wonderful way of life. Very simple. (laughs) Pretty clear. And uh, so I bought into that uh, for a lot of for a lot of years, and uh, have to live with it now. And still, many years later, trying to work it all through. But that's the benevolent morality that I was talking about. Now, what happens when you take that away? Well, you, I like let's say for me, I discover that well, you know, it's not such a bad thing to be to be a, a kind of bad person sometimes. I don't mean literally bad, but just doing things that counter that benevolent morality that I grew up with. 
I was always told to just go along and be quiet and don't say too much. Now, these days, I'm writing a book on the Marquis de Sade. You know, that would, that would not have been approved of by my parents. You know, that's not the thing to do. Write about St. Joseph or somebody, but not the Marquis de Sade. So I, I think what I've done is I have found a whole world open up for me when I get shed that morality I grew up with. And I'm really enjoying looking at some of the things that would have been the forbidden fruit when I was a child. And I'm... I'm I'm exploring these things, and not in a bad way. I'm not going out acting wildly. I'm doing it, you know, in my own way, somewhat intellectually and somewhat as a therapist. So that, to me, has been a great liberation. And I find all kinds of interesting things about life that are attractive and fun and pleasurable and not so horrible, but they would be bad in terms of that old morality. Mm. And life is a lot more interesting, isn't it, when, when you, you open up to all of that? It's, it's very interesting. And here's the point I wanted to say a while ago. I was trying to remember it. That when you do that, you become a more moral person than you would be if you remained in that benevolent morality. You're more moral because of the, the, your complexity and because that you've sorted things out more. And you understand that a lot of these issues are gray, and some of them are, are very fine, hang on very fine points, and on individuality and style. And the other thing, the interesting point here, I, is a wonderful uh, thought that comes out of uh, Georges Bataille, who's a French writer, that the erotic life always requires a transgression, he says. I always like that. And in order to really love life and be in life as a loving person, you have to transgress. You can't just be free, innocent all the time and never have made a mistake. You have to break the rules. You have to, you have to constantly maybe break rules in order to be a real, moral, individual person. That is so wonderful, and I think that's the perfect note for us to stop on. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's so, so good to talk to you again. This, this was a great conversation, and I'm sure that everybody in the Seekers Forum is going to be very happy to learn from you, as always. I, I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. Well, Mark, this is a difficult topic, but it's a very fruitful one. I'm surprised and very happy that you picked it. <laughs>